All right, man, I just shoveled so much snow. <laughs> I got to sit down. I was going to watch this um, Patricia Churchland on the knowledge argument thing, so I figured why not uh, have you guys watch it with me. Maybe we'll learn something. I, I've been seeing around town and here, hithers and yonder <laughs> um, that her take on the knowledge argument uh, is caused a lot of kerfluffle, let's say, on the Twitter sphere in the philosophy world. So I want to see what she has to say. What is this, only 15 minutes or so? Let's get into it. <laughs> Hello, I'm Patricia Churchland. I Wait a minute, what is this? The Royal Institute of Philosophy's 15-minute masterclass series. Okay. Brings you accessible overviews of 30 problems in philosophy from eminent philosophers. In this video, Patricia will show uh, yeah, uh, okay. Huh, interesting. When was this? January 24th, huh? Masterclass. <laughs> All right, so this is supposed to be like a introduction, an actual introduction to the knowledge argument. Let's see what she says. I'm at the University of California in San Diego. I am an emerita professor. Um, I work at the interface of neuroscience on the one hand and philosophy on the other. People have wondered for a long time whether what we experience through touch, through smell, whether those things are really properties of the physical brain or whether they might actually belong to a non-physical soul. And Descartes, of course, famously said they must belong to a non-physical soul. And since Descartes, uh, uh, since Descartes' own argument was not terribly convincing, philosophers have Wow. Okay. She's coming out swinging there. <laughs> um, I mean, I know substance dualism is typically people have thought uh, the mind is the non-physical thing, including like uh, qualitative experiences, phenomenal fields. Did Descartes really think that? I don't know if historically that's all that accurate. I get the feeling kind of that he thinks all the sensation and shit is... Uh, the bodily stuff and that the mind is like rational language, thought like stuff. But, you know, it's tricky with Descartes because there's the awareness of the sense. I don't know. Anyway, so um, I wish I knew more about that, uh, the historical Descartes, because I do think he does get caricatured in, in a way as a guy who thought this simplistic thing was actually, I think there's something more interesting often um, going on there, as with a lot of these historical parents. Anyway, okay, but the other thing, what she said, that no one found this argument convincing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, I don't know, really. Maybe not nowadays, although there are still people, conceivability arguments are still quite popular amongst those who find issues, take issues with physicalism. I'm not myself necessarily one of them, but uh, yeah, anyway, so, so <laughs> she's cooking the books here a bit. <laughs> Tried to explore that question argument was not terribly convincing. Philosophers have tried to explore that question, uh, not really using data so much as using particular arguments. And one argument that got a Not using data. Um, so the question is, <clears throat> is the mind physical or not physical? And so what data are we going to use to pursue that question. <laughs> um, but I get what she's saying. She's, criti she's criticizing, and I, and I take this line seriously too, that uh, most of the arguments against physicalism are a priori arguments that are not based on empirical results, but are based on uh, conceptual analysis, which uh, we should have some reason to be skeptical of. So, you know, I know something about her background and I know her, uh, some of the familiar issues here, but uh, um, anyway, let's hear what she has to say. Lot of play in the last century was, uh, what's known as Frank Jackson's Mary argument. Suppose that Mary... Mary argument. Frank Jackson. Oh, it says it in the title. Mary? Mary argument. It should be knowledge argument. Okay, but anyway, no one cares. 
Mary knows all the physical information there is to know. Mary's in black and white room. Okay, right. Is a scientist who knows all the information there is to know about the brain. All She's very lucky in that regard. She knows all the physical information there is to know about the brain, including all about color vision. However, Mary has been sequestered in a room that is entirely black and white, and consequently, she has never been exposed to any color. So the question is this, will Mary learn something when she emerges from her room into the wider world beyond? And everyone seems to agree, yes, she will learn something. Not everyone, but most people agree that she will learn what it's like to, see, to have the conscious experience. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay. And now comes the conclusion. So while she's in the room... By the way, let me just say that I've never really found the knowledge argument to be the best way to, to do this sort of stuff. I, I much prefer the kind of Descartes argument, the zombie argument. Um, like especially as formulated by Chalmers, because it makes everything much clearer, the knowledge argument. There are too many related issues uh, that crop up, um, like that uh, we need experience to know things. <laughs> it, it just muddies the water. There's too many ways of wiggling around, like what really is the conclusion um, of this argument, uh, someone should make it a lot clearer. Anyway, I, let's see what's, I, I should shut up and let, I want to hear what she has to say. <laughs> Mary does not know something about seeing green, namely what green looks like. Right. And the conclusion that Frank Jackson and many others wish to draw from that is that color experience, therefore, cannot be a state of the physical brain. Right, because as it's formulated here, if she knows all the physical information, then um, if she doesn't know something about her own color experience, then there's some information, uh, that's what she learns, um, which isn't physical information, because by the first premise up there, she knows all the physical information. So in this way of putting it, the conclusion isn't really technically that color experience can't be a brain state, but it, it's really that... Um, it involves a kind of information which isn't included in the, all the physical information that she has. Um, in other words, physicalism, according to which all properties of our experience, our knowledge, our capacity to move, all properties uh, are subject to physical rules, physical laws. Oh. Dramatic. Okay, so hold on a second. So the idea is that physicalism can't be true because there are um, there is information which isn't physical information, which is corresponding to what Mary learns here. Okay, great. No, no physical here. rules, Music physical again. laws. Pretty classy. I guess this is a master class after all. Should have had a so tie the on. first premise, hair. namely that Mary knows everything there is to know about the physical properties of seeing green actually begs the question against the physicalist. Uh -huh. And to see why that's true, we're going to go a little bit further. Now, here, of course, is a depiction of the human brain. So the first premise begs the question against the physicalist. <clears throat> the first premise says that Mary knows all the physical information about the color experience. Um, Where, oh, here it is. Mary knows all the physical information there is to know about the brain, including all about color vision. So that, that premise begs the question <clears throat> against physicalism? That premise? Uh, so, huh? How does that premise beg the question? I, I mean, I, I get the, I think I understand the general idea that she's going for here, which is that, uh,
if you assume she doesn't know like what it's like to see red, then you're just assuming that that's not physical information. Um, and that's the only way that you could sort of assume that she knows all the physical information that there is to know about color vision in her room. Uh, because if she really did have all that physical information, she would know what it's like to see red since that's physical information. Um, it's just, it just is a physical state. So it would be physical information. Um, I, that's the way, see, when I was a grad student, I remember reading and hearing about this line that the, 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 this was question begging um, and thinking of it in this way and thinking, uh, huh, I mean, yeah, I don't find it very plausible. <laughs> I'm trying to be charitable. But let me see how she fleshes this out because I might be jumping the gun. Physical properties of seeing green actually begs the question against the physicalist. Okay. And to see why that's true, yeah. we're going to go a little bit further. Now, here, of course, is a depiction of the human brain, the physical human brain. And what we know is that there are many different pathways to knowledge that some of them involve. Okay, wait a minute. So pathways of knowledge. So because we're going to be talking about knowing what it's like, let me anticipate a bit here. I mean, this always has bothered me because I think people talk past each other when they talk about knowing what it's like um, and, and learning what it's like and having that knowledge and stuff like that. So she's going to be able to say there are some ways of acquiring knowledge, like knowledge of what it's like, that require having the experience. So in order for Mary to know what it's like, she would have to have the experience. So therefore we're sort of, I can sort of see how she's gonna work herself into this line that um, some people think is misunderstanding the argument, but uh, maybe I'm reading too much into it. I'm, I might be getting ahead of myself. I'm getting too excited. <laughs> okay. Of language and the prefrontal cortex, but many of them do not. Many of the pathways involve sensory systems and they are not language mediated at all. So let me be a little bit more specific about that. Mary in her black and white room lacks knowledge that's accessible only via very specific pathways, namely the visual pathways to color. And that's in the dorsal stream involving region V4. Very simplistically put, the signals go from the eyeball, from the retina, to an area in the thalamus, then to V1. And at V1, they split into what's called the dorsal pathway, which goes up here, and the ventral pathway. And color signals are diverted to the ventral pathway. And you have to have this particular region, namely V4, in order to see color. And we know that, for example, from lesion studies as well as from stimulation studies and, and in other ways. So we know that V4 is essential. So one of the things you want to ask about poor old Mary in her black and white room is whether there will ever be any stimulation of the ventral pathway, at least that part of the ventral pathway that involves V4. And it presumably is never stimulated. Now, just to remind you then, the frontal cortex is these frontal bits. Right, so that's an argument that she'll have abnormal color vision and she, when she comes out of her room, she won't really <clears throat> um, have regular color experience. I mean, there are people who make that kind of argument. I guess I wasn't expecting her to do that all of a sudden. All right, so let, here's some stuff I know about. All right, great, but what is her point here? And many of what we think of as the more sophisticated or complicated functions of physical brains require the prefrontal cortex. But apparently, one can have great losses of prefrontal cortex, losses of function of language somewhere in here, for example. No. You can Is she still going to say still have consciousness? She's going to say that. Let's, let's hold on have those kinds of losses <laughs> and still be able to see colors. Consciously see them? 
The prefrontal cortex, uh, this is highly oversimplified, of course, but just to give you the flavor of the kinds of functions that the prefrontal cortex uh, is responsible for um, are not simple perceptions of motion or shape or color, but they involve, as we think of it but don't understand well, higher cognitive functions. One of the things... Right, okay, so... Is this how she thinks it begs the question? <clears throat> Is her idea that the argument begs the question against physicalism because it assumes that she would have normal color vision? Because this is starting to sound to me like an argument against thought experiments. Like, okay, so this is very simplified, but the but we can always get around that by building in some some caveats, like uh, you know, um, she has amnesia. Uh, she doesn't know like which one is red, which one is blue. And then you show her some stuff and say, pick out which one. I mean. So the dualist is going to say she's not going to be able to do that, even if you can get it. So even if she had normal color vision and she was um, see, saw colors and stuff like that and uh, trained, maybe you could imagine that it was done unconsciously during her sleep or something like that, or that you had the, that part of the cortex implanted overnight one day. I mean, there's always ways of the thought experiment. <laughs> um, there's always ways to get around the issue. The issue is is simply... Uh, to ask whether knowing all the physical information there is, is enough to allow you to know what it's like. Um, so she would know about this kind of stuff that we're discussing here, or that uh, Professor Churchill is discussing. Um, I'm not really sure why uh, this is, how it's going to be getting to the begging the question point. I mean, I get, I grant that it's relevant. I, I like his stuff, obviously, I love it. But uh, I'm wondering why it's begging the question. So let me continue. That you want to ask is, realistically, would Mary have normal color vision upon leaving her room? Okay. And because we have to assume that since Mary has learned all this neuroscience over many decades, that her brain has long since to be in the developmental stage. And what we know is that in all stages of early development, the appropriate kind of stimulus is really important for setting up the appropriate kind of wiring. And most recently, this has been demonstrated by some really remarkable studies on children who were born blind, but who subsequently underwent surgery that allowed them to see. So the surgery and the work has been done by Panwa Sinha at MIT, and the children involved are children in the very poor areas in India. Why is it that they are congenitally blind? And the answer really depends on vitamin A. If the pregnant mother does not have sufficient vitamin A during her pregnancy, then what happens in the eyeball is these very thick cataracts develop or sometimes corneal tears develop so that when the infant is born, it is unable to develop the capacity to see. When Sinha realized that this was essentially owed to cataracts, and since we know that cataracts can be removed and replaced by artificial lenses that are actually very efficient, he began to do that in very large numbers of children in India. So one of the things that we maybe didn't used to be able to answer was whether Mary would have normal color vision upon leaving her room. And the answer is essentially she would not. Um, now, one of the things that uh, was- I mean, we've already, yeah, right. I, that's great. Um, but where's the big in the question? <laughs> 
I think there are ways to get around it. You could easily imagine scenarios that kind of try to make the point. But this is like why I like the zombie cases better. It's, it's a pure uh, case of just trying to stipulate the scenario that you're interested in and reason about it. Um, <clears throat> this one's very slop, very messy, I would say, uh, the Jackson. And ultimately, they're equivalent. I, th I think Chalmers has shown that in his 2D paper against materialism, that ultimately they... They, uh, the knowledge argument, when it's formulated in a certain way, relies on the idea that, yeah, I know, if the, all the physical facts are instantiated, then um, there's consciousness can't be known a priori. And it's the same as the zombies. Uh, so that one's just cleaner, in my opinion. It's even cleaner than the, than the Kripke version. I think it's like the clearest version of the argument. Not that I endorse it, obviously, but I just think it's very clear. <laughs> and I like that. Whereas this one, and there's lots of uh, all this stuff. Like, I don't understand where the relevance here is to her charge of begging the question. Very clear about these children after about 48 hours when the swelling in their eye had had a chance to uh, diminish. One of the things that people did notice was that they were really not able to identify objects at all. They didn't see colors at all. Some of them eventually, if they were still quite young, were able to go on to develop the capacity uh, to see colors in a sort of a way, but nothing like the way a normal seeing child who developed normally would be able to see colors. Right. And we have some evidence one from particular cats, difficulty that I think is, is worth mentioning is that that it seems to us so obvious that if you see, say, one hand on top of another hand, um, that one is behind, you can tell where one hand is and what part is blocked. But these children who were congenitally blind, it took them quite a, a while, like months, before they were able to discriminate objects where one, to some degree, maybe small degree, overlapped another. What was found, which I think is really quite interesting, was that as long as the children had really quite good motion capacity, they were able to acquire a capacity to identify objects and see that all of the lines and shapes and so forth went with this, and a different set of lines and shapes went with that. But in general, the capacity for color vision was not terribly good. Those of us who have been privileged to have sight from birth see what's called the Ponzo illusion. Now, on the left-hand side, you can see there is a red line there and a red line there. The red line here looks longer than the red line there. Yeah. In actual fact, mm -hmm. they are exactly the same size. Right. And in the mueller lyre illusion, which many of you will know about, um, the horizontal line is exactly the same length in top, middle, and bottom. And yet, of course, it looks much longer in this particular case. Right. So one of the things that was observed in these children was that uh, they were quite subject to the Ponzo illusion as well as to the Mueller liar illusion. So that's the Molyneux question. <clears throat> yeah, but what does this have to do with the knowledge argument? No, okay. So did she say they weren't or were subject to this? Was illusion? that? Uh, they were quite subject to the Ponzo illusion as well as to the Mueller liar illusion. Okay. And the Molyneux question is an interesting question. So, but I, I feel like I'm wondering if this is going to come back around to the knowledge argument and the begging the question thing. So, I, so far, I haven't seen anything that really addresses it. And Mary might not have regular color vision in the if if is she a biological human really kept in this scenario. Um. But uh, I still think well, there are ways we could control for that in the thought experiment. Um, this kind of stuff came up once before, just kind of a tangent, but when we were talking about uh, the knowledge argument, um, uh, Pete Mandic, Swamp Mary. So Swamp Mary is a, uh, you have Mary, she comes out, regular Mary, she sees red, she goes, oh, that's what it's like to see red. And then she falls into a coma 
And then somewhere else, lightning strikes a swamp and an instant duplicate is made of the coma post-release Mary. And Mandic wants to say, uh, Pete wants to say that she knows what it's like to see red, whereas I was like, hmm, she's not conscious. How does she know what it's like to see red? You know, he's like, well, like how you know your birthday when you're, you know, you still know it, you can wake up and say it. And she could, but uh, it's not clear to me that that really is a kid, the kind of case that we want to be focusing on here. We want to focus on um, having the conscious experience, being able to recognize it and, and sort of having him be like, oh, that's what it's like. Uh, so knowing what it's like requires like the experience being present in the real robust sense. Um, so I guess the conclusion that could follow from this on Churchland's interpretation would be that Mary won't know what it's like to see red even after her release. <laughs> um, because uh, she won't have normal color vision. And so uh, that's really what we should expect. And so the idea that she learns like what it's like to see red. See, that would be the question begging. It seems like the premise that she's that that Churchill would be attacking then in that case would be that that uh, the premise that she learned something new, um, which is uh, being a bonga. If we go back all the way back here, uh, will Mary learn something new? Question: Yes. Um, so I uh, mean, sorry. Answer: Yes. And uh, it seems to me that's really the question begging thing that she's trying to get at, maybe. Is that well? Mary can't learn what it's like to see red because she won't have normal color vision. She's gonna come out and go. Mur, mur, mur. Um, but even so, suppose her normal color vision was restored and she learned how to see colors in the regular way. She'd be quite surprised when she had the conscious experience of red. And I don't think that there's anything. That's the traditional reasoning, and I don't think there's anything what Churchland's saying here that would, would make us question that. But let's go back to Molly News question. Where was that? Are we way back over here? Where were we? Oh, shoot. I should have. <laughs> oh, hey, look at that. Who's this right here? Molly New. 88. Molly New. Oh, Molly New. In 1688, Molly New asked Locke an interesting question. Suppose that a congenitally blind person can identify a mug by touch. Now, if they gain sight, can they pick out that mug only using vision? And the answer is no, they cannot. They have to learn that that sensory experience of touch and this visual experience of color and shape belong to one and the same thing. And it will not surprise you to know that this steam coming out of the hot mug is very, very puzzling to someone who just has regained their sight. Now, part of what I want to emphasize here is, is the importance of pathways and the importance of a developmental route in those pathways. One might say, and you'll see that this is a ridiculous argument that I'm about to give you, but one might say this. If Sally knows everything there is to know about pregnancy, and if Sally is, uh, let us say, celibate, then as long as pregnancy is a physical, process, then Sally, simply by, virtuing, uh, by virtue of knowing everything there is to know about pregnancy, Sally should get pregnant. Now, nobody's ever been taken in by that argument because... <laughs> um, wait, okay, so I, this is the reason, I saw some of this on Twitter, this is what people were talking about. Um, okay, so no, she should know what it's like to be pregnant. <laughs> if the view were right, that's that's the correct response. Um, if if physicalism were true in the way that we're thinking about it here, then complete physical knowledge should allow you to deduce a priori without having the experience yourself what it would be like to be pregnant, not to become pregnant. Um, <clears throat> now, 
one reason that I think that this is relevant to that discussion that I just brought up a second ago about the Mandic thing and the uh, Peter, Pete's, uh, I was trying to say Peter Mandic, uh, his name, the plume. <laughs> uh, well, how that's relevant to uh, Pete Mandic's paper on Swamp Mary um, is because I think that the, 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 the reason why people like Churchland have this idea is that they say, well, look, knowing what it's like means having the experience. That's what I was just kind of saying. That's the traditional view that when you know what it's like, you the experience is there. So if Mary is going to have that kind of knowledge and that kind of knowledge requires the experience being present, then uh, it's like they're asking for Sally to be pregnant by learning some biology. Um, learning the biology doesn't give you the thing in question. Uh, it helps you understand the processes involved in it, but it doesn't produce the thing. So now uh, a typical, I think that I'm pretty sure that's where this is going because of the pregnancy thing that just came up. And now the traditionalists on the other side, the fans of the knowledge argument, they often respond by saying, no, you're misunderstanding the argument. You don't have to have the experience. You just have to have the knowledge uh, from from the uh, from from the physical information. You've got to know what it's like, and it does seem to be a bit fishy at that point because what does that mean according to them to know what it's like if it's not to have the experience, right? If the, if you can't know what it's like without having the experience, then how can you know what it's like without having the experience, physicalism or not? And I think that, uh, you know, I've said this before and I've talked to people about it in my consciousness live thing. And I don't know, people don't ever seem to really care about this point, but I think it's very important. Um, and that's the idea that everybody has to, has to say something about how we know about our conscious experiences, how we come to have acquaintance or knowledge or uh, that kind of awareness of our own experiences that we have um and whether you'd like phenomenal concepts or some other account of it or whatever the case might be we've got to say something about that about what it means to know what it's like uh, and um it seems to me that the fans of the knowledge argument assume that there's a kind of a sentence like it's like this and you can't really do that right because if if something like phenomenal concepts are it's the right story, then it's like this. You just have to kind of point to the experience, but you can't do that without having the experience first. So this is why I've said in my response to the knowledge argument, Mary needs the concept first. She needs the right phenomenal concept. She, and it's just that you need to have the experience to have the concept. It's it's not that um, uh, that difficult to see that there are some, con you get the concept in a certain way, and that might be the only way to acquire the concept. In which case, she'd have to come out of her room and, you know, then we'd have this debate about her normal color vision or not. But um, so does knowing what it's like require having the experience? Everybody says yes. So how could you know what it's like merely on the basis of um, the physical information? It, now, that's, the, I think, the charitable way to interpret the kind of view that she's saying, and then when the two sides are arguing back and forth against each other, saying, well, you're misunderstanding the argument. How could you be so dense? That's not how you do it. Yes, it is. Look at what he says. It seems the way that what they're really arguing about is something more fundamental um, involving knowledge of what it's like. Um, and uh, anyway, um, Let's finish this up because I think we're almost done. Is this almost in? Yeah, okay. It's not that far off to the end. And this is basically the punchline, right? So the, the knowledge argument assumes that you would have to um, get the experience of red from knowing the physical theory, just like this pregnancy thing. There is very clear that the brain can know everything there is to know about pregnancy uh, up to a point, but that to actually be pregnant requires a very different pathway. And this- Right, so that's kind of her idea, I guess, is that, um, um, I mean, to know all this stuff requires 
having the experience, like having a different pathway, like encountering it directly. Um, but I, I think that that earlier point that I made is still the right thing to say in response to this kind of move, which is that if you knew all the physical stuff, then you should know what it's like to be pregnant. You should know, um, now, does knowing what it's like to be pregnant require having the experiences of being pregnant or not? Um, that's a question I think that goes back to the way I like to think about things. But uh, still, it doesn't. it's not clear that right off the bat, you need to have the pregnancy. You need to have knowledge of what it's like, um, which puts it back into the experiential realm uh, in the way that we would expect it to be, given that it's the knowledge argument. But... Um, I, I do think this is a really deep issue here. Um, and it isn't just like one side being silly or misunderstanding the argument. I think there's something deep and important, which is uh, which the sides are missing in a sense um, on the other side, which is that there's a question about what the right way to think about knowing what it's like is. Same is true in the case of color vision. If the pathways and V4 are never stimulated, then uh, it would be ridiculous to expect that you will see green. Just as in the case of Sally, who knows everything there is to know, everything physical there is to know about pregnancy, of course she is not going to get pregnant because the right pathways uh, are not yet part of the story. So it takes about three months for a person. So yeah, that's the basic idea. It's like being pregnant is like knowing what it's like. It's having the thing, right? The experience is knowing what it's like. Whereas what is the, so what is the other side going to say? They're going to say, look, you, to know what it's like requires um, knowing like the essential nature of greenness or redness. So it's, it's like, uh, it's essential nature is what they're asking you. So sort of like knowing what a triangle is, um, uh, it's essential nature and is mathematically can be described in the terms of these equations, et cetera, and these properties. And then you know everything about triangles, yay. Uh, okay, is there anything like that you can do with redness um, or conscious experience? And yeah, there I think you, know, you get into this idea about, no, you need to have the experience in order to get to know what it's like. And I really think that's the line that she's pushing here, um, that they're unfairly saying that you could know what it's like without having the experience. Um, and that that's not something that the physicalist is committed to, right? That's the way I want to in interpret. Now, I don't know. Uh, I'm interested to hear what other people think, but let, let's let this finish up. Because and then again, I like this other point that these... Um, Generally, the empirical results are relevant to these thought experiments. So maybe Mary, you know, it's it's a it's too simplistic the way it's set up. And who is congenitally blind? Now Mary is not, but she is color deprived, which is rather like color blind. One of the things we know about people who are born congenitally blind is that the visual cortex begins to take over some of the functions of touch. So if you're reading Braille, that will be done in visual cortex. Okay. Now, um, I want to go on just to say a very simple thing about taste. Phenylthiocarbamide is a chemical that in Caucasians, about 25% find it gives a very yeah okay so i don't see where this is going but this is a simple thing about taste so there's this thing in in certain people like me um some people find it pleasant some people find it bitter some people don't find it any kind of taste at all okay it's the same chemical in each case though and so what you can't predict how it's going to affect them is that what she's going to say what's she going to say here bitter taste 25 percent have no bitter taste 50 percent have some somewhat bitter taste now, if I were Frank Jackson, I might say, see, what this tells us is that it's all about the non-physical soul taste. But it isn't. This is a genetic difference so that depending on the receptor you have, there will be a genetic difference and that will determine whether you taste it as bitter or not. Finally, I want to just... Well, wait, 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 a quick, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Excuse me, Professor Churchland. <laughs> uh, no. So, no. Okay. 
of course, the whole point is that we can know all of these things and still not, uh, or Mary wouldn't know that uh, what bitterness is like, right? So you could know about the genes and all the correlations that exist and the things people say and, oh, well, you could predict that this person is going to say it's bitter and you could predict that person is going to because you know about their genes and these things. Um, but how does this at all address the issue? Uh, I mean, I guess there's a kind of what was she attributing to the dualist is the idea that it's all subjective. You see, there's no way you could do science on this stuff. But that's not really the point, right? The point is that you could know all this stuff and there still would be a question about what is it like? What is bitterness like? And then there's the heart, you know, that's a, that's a separate question. But uh, so I don't think this really addresses the issue. But maybe I'm, am I missing something? I'm being uncharitable here, maybe? I don't know. I feel like uh, something about the way it's being presented makes me be like, I feel like she's being dismissive of these. <laughs> maybe that's a problem with me. <laughs> nah, so I should chill out. <laughs> whether you taste it as bitter or not. Finally, I want to just say that there are environmental factors that determine what, how something tastes. There are biological factors that determine how things taste. And interestingly, we have begun to understand quite a bit about that. So when we think about Frank Jackson's argument and the physical brain, you want to say, look, if data on congenital blindness and taste are relevant, what on earth does Frank Jackson and his supporters think? What is the causal relation between the brain and spooky stuff? First of all, poor Frank Jackson, he already converted to physicalism. Oh, he's mad at this. He already repented. He's done. He's He's a representationalist, like a hardcore. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, he was an epiphenomenalist at the time that the argument was presented. Um, in fact, the paper that was originally presented was something like epiphenomenal quality or something like that, right? So he defended epiphenomenalism. Um, and so epiphenomenalism is not a refuted view. I hate to break into the world of the universe, but it is a view which remains unrefuted. <laughs> it's widely not thought of as a contender, but there are some people that still defend it. And there are reasons to defend it. So uh, you could say that, um, but, but you could say a lot of other stuff too. So I'm not really sure the spooky theory stuff here is that supposed to scare us i mean um i like physicalism because of thinking of partially because of causal relation stuff and i think that um that carries a lot of weight uh but i don't think it's all that difficult for someone who's convinced by these considerations to answer this kind of question but I know that like this kind of approach and then Dennett too does it. The, and then what happened kind of mocking question, which I don't find very useful or interesting actually, um, because there's <laughs> lots of stuff you could say as a matter of fact. But anyway, let's, I don't want to turn this into 7,000 years of discussing this, but uh, this doesn't seem to me to be very useful because everybody knows the data are relevant since everyone says Mary's going to have all that data. Um, the question is, can she know what it's like? Uh, and yeah, again, I don't find that question very helpful. The question I think is very helpful is like, is, is it a priori knowable that there's conscious experience? And if so, what kind, um, on the basis of physical information? That's a better question in my opinion. Anyway, let's finish this up. And the consciousness stuff and how do spooky theories mesh with genetics and with brain data and what's so striking is that they have absolutely no answer and basically no interest thanks <laughs>
uh, they have no answer and no that. interest to how do their theories mess with genetic and brain data. That seems to me to be not charitable. Who's they though? It depends on who the they is. Some of them might not. I don't know. But I think a lot of people do think that, I mean, I'm not a dualist. I mean, I could be a dualist if I wanted to. You don't get to tell me what I want I am, but uh, I'm friendly to physicalism. Um, I defend the view that physicalism hasn't been refuted. <laughs> That's about as far as I'm willing to go. <laughs> uh, so I certainly don't think that the knowledge argument or, you know, refutes physicalism. I think it gives a person reason to reject physicalism if that person finds the conceivability of these things and so forth. They can reason them. You can... So it's rational for a person and so forth. That's what I think the usefulness of the stuff is. That's great, wonderful, no one cares. Um, but uh, I, I certainly wouldn't say that there's no interest on the non-physicalist side to, to give an account of how the theory fits with the scientific picture. Everybody knows, not everybody, most serious persons know that science is not something you go tinkering with. The, the neuroscience and physics of our day is well established and our theories better be consonant with it. My understanding is that people who like this argument either adopt a version of epiphenomenalism or a kind of interactive dualism, maybe with a kind of overdetermination. Uh, you could have a kind of quantum mechanical dualism. It's not too impossible to imagine that. It's my favorite form of dualism, everyone knows. I've written a couple of blog posts on it. Uh, very much a fan of Chalmers and McQueen uh, and their work on that. Anyway, um, so you could do that if you really want to. You could be a panpsychist, which is all the rage currently. Um, or something else. I mean, there is a, either way, the brain and this non-physical mind don't have to be modeled on the way Descartes thought of things in the 17th century, <laughs> which is sort of the way that I get the feeling that these people uh, think the state of dualism is. And I got that feeling when I read Dennett's book. I wrote a whole rant about it on my blog over at Philosophy Sucks, which is the name of my blog because philosophy sucks. Um, where I was like, dude, the problem with Dennett is that he thinks it's the 50s still and everyone's still talking about Descartes, but we've moved on. Um, now, if you want to make the case that really we haven't moved on, then I'm open to hearing that. But I don't really think this kind of rhetorical criticism that the other side doesn't care about how the mind and the brain interact with each other. This has been the central concern, I would say. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, interesting. So I, I, I think maybe, yeah, there is a, a way to be charitable and, and take what she's saying, um, very seriously. And I don't know if people have been doing that. Uh, so I, I do think that some of some, maybe there's been some misunderstanding across talk between these, uh, two camps. Who knows? What do I know? So what do you guys think? Anyway. 